Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiator. Right, so recently I did a video looking at how much the cuirass, the medieval cuirass, so this is my 15th century uh, breast and back with um, placard and full. I don't have the tassets attached at the moment, but how much this weighs. And some of you wanted me to put it on. Um, I couldn't do that in that video because I didn't have anyone to help me put it on. Um, and that touches on a couple of interesting uh, kind of spin-off questions that come out of that video talking about the medieval cuirass. Now, before I go on, I'll just say I hope that the sound is okay here. I'll probably be a bit echoey, more echoey than normal. I can't attach my mic to myself for obvious reasons. Uh, last time I did that, we had some horrible, <laughs> horrible uh, interference noise from um, the mic against my breastplate. So, um, so first up, um, this is um, hardened carbon steel made by um, Mark Vickers at St George Armoury. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's a Milanese, roughly Milanese, um, style cuirass. Actually, the rest of my cuirass, we've um, got the um, uh, one of the pauldrons here. Just put the stick down for a second. And um, so, got you know, various bits. It's all matching, and it's an Italian export style. Um, there's the uh, greave here, and so on and so forth. So, um, yes, absolutely, more armor videos will be coming in due course. Um, however, as I mentioned in the previous video. I'm waiting on a better or new arming doublet um, and various other bits and pieces I need that com to complete my um, gear before I can properly uh, demonstrate things and talk about um, armor. But we can talk about some of the pieces um, and so that's what I'm doing here. Now, in terms of the cuirass, the first thing that came up is can I put on armor by myself? And the basic answer is no. So you will have seen that I recently did a video with Destria that was actually filmed way back at the beginning of the spring before lockdown. Um, but where we showed essentially that person was, uh, Nick was having two people armoring, uh, armoring him, so helping to arm him, to put his um, armor and all his other equipment on him. And this would be probably a usual kind of arrangement whereby a knight or at least a well-off man at arms, the kind of person that could afford this type of armour, um, would, would have at least two helpers to help them get dressed. And we have to bear in mind that that's not something actually specific to armour, that's actually just something to do with getting dressed. And you have to remember that manpower was relatively cheap. Uh, in the medieval period, and, and still is in the developing world, compared to things like the cost of armour or the cost of horses or ships or whatever. Um, so the fact is that you would have lots of servants and the sort of person that wear this armour would live in a house with lots of servants. And that's something that modern people, of course, I don't think necessarily immediately realise or think of, um, that anybody who lived in the sort of household where they owned this type of armour would have a bunch of servants anyway. Um, and of course a knight would have specific um, helpers to actually you know, get them dressed in their civilian clothes or in their military clothes, i.e. armour. Um, and of course to clean and maintain it, and that's another aspect. Modern people that own armour like me and most of the people out there that joust um, and do foot combats and reenactment and everything else have to clean and maintain their own armour. Some of them even make their own armour or maintain their own armour, fix it, whatever. Obviously, historically, no knight or man at arms would have done that themselves. Uh, it pretty much would have been done for them by their numerous um, staff and you know, the professionals of, of, that, of that job. But so I can't put this on myself, um, but I can put some elements of my armour on myself at, in a pinch. And that was an interesting question that came up. People said that if you really had to, if it was, you know, if you were on campaign, could you, if you were um, unarmoured, and say the, the camp got attacked in the night, could you pull on some of your army yourself? And yes, you could pull on some of it. So definitely you could put your arming doublet and your hose, your, your clothes on, your shoes. Um, you could pull a male shirt on if that was part of your equipment and armour. And it's one of the great things about male shirts, you can just put them on and take them off easily and you don't get really hot in them or anything like that. Um, obviously you can put helmets and gauntlets on, you can put pretty much all of your leg armour. Personally, I can put all of my leg armour on myself with no problem at all. So you can put all of your leg armour on and a male shirt, and you could put an, at least an upper breastplate on yourself. I can put this upper breastplate on, so the element up here, the breast and back. I can't personally, not well anyway, and certainly not quickly or easily, put the placard and fold on. If you, some, some armours, some English armours, according to uh, Dr. Capwell's reconstructions, have a separate fold and placard. If you have a separate fold and placard, it, certainly you could put the 
fold on yourself just about, whether you can put the placard on yourself, it's difficult. As you'll see on my back, I have a strap in the back which connects my um, placard to my back plate, which there's no way on earth I can do that up myself. And it is also very difficult to do up the straps at the side of the fold here. Um, so you, with this type of armour at least, with the Milanese harness, uh, you certainly need some help. Might be slightly different with the Gothic harness because they've got a shorter fall, um, although that's a later period, that's really kind of 1480s and the end of the 15th century. Um, so, uh, with this, generally speaking, yes, you do need help, uh, so to speak. Um, in terms of the arms, you 100% need help because your uh, most of your arm armour, your van braces, is um, pointed to the outside of your jacket here, and you can't physically tie a knot one-handed, at least I can't, whilst holding the harness up as well. And if we look at the um, uh, pauldron for a second, and obviously there's different types of these, these are large Italian style uh, pauldrons, but if you, whether it's a, a sort of an earlier style spalder or whether it's a gothic harness um, spalder, whether it's large pauldrons like this, they all point, see those little holes up here, they all tie or point up here. Either some people do it to this strap or most people, I think more historically correctly, do it to the um, arming doublet, which is what um, I do, and what I will be doing with the new arming doublet, and um, that points up to there, and you can't do that knot up uh, yourself um, when it's up there, for obvious reasons, you can't really get to it. So 100%, you do really need at least one other person to help you get your armour on. However, and this is the point I made in the comments, if there are two of you, if there are two knights, it might be a bit of a faff, it might not be that uh, simple, but two knights, I think, could almost always, under pressure, arm each other. Um, so it might not be preferable, it might not be ideal, it might not even be something that was done very often, or I won't say ever, because it almost certainly was done occasionally, but um, you could absolutely have two knights who help each other put their armour on, do the knots up, tighten up the, you know, do the straps as tight as they need to be and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, minimum of one other helper you definitely need. Now, the second part of this video I want to talk about is mobility constriction with armour. Now, this is a um, big, uh, a big, big topic and it's something that I will cover in far more detailed depth in a future video. Um, but I just want to talk about it in reference to the cuirass. Now, I think that a lot of people who who haven't worn armour sometimes have um, a either they underestimate how much armour uh, affects your movement, your mobility and things like this, or they overestimate. And it's quite difficult actually to explain to someone who hasn't worn armour what it's actually like. Um, and I don't really know what to compare it to other than wearing armour. Um, so yes, you get hot, yes, you get fatigued. We're going to put those inside. We're just going to talk about range of motion and mobility. Now, this varies a lot depending on what type of armour it is. So if we're looking at 14th century mixture of, you know, full mail hauberk with a coat of plates and spalders and uh, plate arms and um, maybe a, a bassinet with um, um, an avantail, this is actually fairly flexible uh, and forgiving to your range of motion. Um, but again, it depends on the exact design of the coat of plates, it depends on the exact design of the arms, the spalders. Um, spalders weren't always worn, and we also have to say that sometimes, you can see in the medieval art, that certain bits of armour were left off. Um, spalders being a good example, uh, some people just have a male, um, the male hawk is up here, um, so you've got obviously full motion of your shoulders up here. But, in reference precisely to the breastplate, there are some limitations, uh, and the two main limitations are how your waist can flex and how your uh, shoulders and, or arms are able to, the range of motion you're able to get out of those. Now, first of all, the waist. This is something that I will look at in greater depth in a future video, but I'm just going to briefly mention it here. So the first thing to mention is that the waist on armour should sit in the natural waist, not at what a lot of modern people think of as their waist, which is really your hips, which is where you wear trousers these days. Okay. So if you think about a, a picture, for example, Talhofer or something like that, that show the doublets, very, very tight in at the waist. It's the same thing with the breastplate, it comes in tight here. And that means that the natural bending point of the body, you can move fully in any direction, a bit like a wasp, 
uh, because that is the articulation point between your upper body and your lower abdomen, as it were. Okay, it's the bending point, pivot point, almost like on some dolls and action figures. You have a, a ball, ball and socket joint in there. That's kind of what we're like. Um, so that's very, very important. And having the waist in the right place is, is super important to uh, your uh, flexibility of your um, upper body. Okay. And if you look at certain uh, movies and TV shows, Game of Thrones is one I like to reel off. You'll often notice the breastplates in that. The armourers have put the waist too low. Um, this has two really, really bad effects. The obvious one is that, first of all, you can't, the actors can't bend. So you see them being very stiff, whether they're fighting or moving around, trying to sit down. Oh, they're trying, struggling to sit down. I've got a stool here. No problem at all for me to sit down. Hi. <laughs> okay, uh, because my waist on my armour is in the correct place. Um, but if it's a breastplate where the waist is too long, you simply can't bend there because what happens is the bottom of the breastplate kind of digs into your crotch. Okay, so that's the first thing. But the second thing, and this is a really nasty effect if you try and fight or ride or joust or fall over uh, in this armour, is if the waist down there, so it's pushing on your crotch or on the top of your legs, then it pushes this bit here of your breastplate up into your windpipe which is really not a nice place to be having a narrow steel edge. Okay, it's rolled, but nevertheless, it's still relatively narrow. Uh, having a hard object being pushed into your windpipe, which actually can kill you, okay? It can do, like rupture the or tear the uh, internals of the windpipe. So horrible. Um, so if someone's breastplate is too long and they fall over, the problem is this rides up and hits them in the throat, which is potentially fatal. Um, so really, this height here, is really really important and you don't want this bit here to come too far up. Remember that can afford to be lower down of course because you're going to have some form of neck defence whether it's a bever or an aventail or uh, the front of a you know a great helm or a great bassinet or something like this. You're going to have that covering that gap anyway and you're going to have a male collar a standard underneath as well. Um, so that's the first thing. Now the second thing is mobility of the arms. So there is always a balance, uh, a seesaw, between how much chest protection you can get here, um, in other words how far the edges of the breast come over this way, and indeed up here, um, so how high up, in other words how big the armholes are, there's always a balance between how big the armholes are, protection versus mobility. Now quite simply, the breastplate if it's well fitted should sit fairly closely to your body up here, um, such that you can still get your arms, you should be able to hug yourself. Just like in those nightly effigies, you should be able to pray. Okay, Your arms should be able to come down fairly close to your sides down here. Okay, um, We won't talk about upper mobility for now very much because that's more to do with the shoulder defences like these than the actual breastplate, but what we're looking at here is front and down and everything in between there. Now why is this important? Well it's super important because you've got to remember at the end of the day an armoured fighting person isn't just to stand there and pray to God or look pretty or whatever and they're not just posing for, for photos. They've got to use weapons. Now admittedly sometimes they might be using a one-handed weapon and if you're using a one-handed weapon the breastplate really doesn't play very much uh, doesn't have much interference whatsoever with these sorts of movements, okay? The arms, the gauntlets and the shoulders might, but the breastplate doesn't really with one-handed weapons. However, with a two-handed weapon, this becomes super important. And of course, two-handed weapons in this period became very, very important on the battlefield, whether it's long swords, pole axes, any kind of pole arm, spears. Um, you're going to have two hands on the weapon. Now, if you've got two hands on the weapon and you want to be able to get into any sorts of the positions that we've seen treatises, and admittedly half sorting is easier, okay, because your hands are further apart, but if you're using a pole axe, um, so your hands are a bit further apart, but you want to be able to swing it, you have to be able to get into positions whereby your arms can still move across your body uh, without being constricted by the breastplate here and you can still get down to these low guards down here. Now, it does partly affect how you stand as well and you'll notice there that I very naturally, and this is something as soon as you put armour on you notice you start doing, I very naturally started turning either my right side or my left side towards the target. Now, if you study medieval treatises, 
you'll be very familiar with this already, okay? So, unlike uh, kendo, for example, which is quite frontal, if we look at medieval artwork of how long swords and pole axes and spears were used, they're pretty much always switching from one side forward to the other side forward. And this is very conducive to fighting with armour of the day because it means that uh, you're not um, going to conflict with your own breastplate so much. So to a certain extent you can be moving around the breastplate without locking up the arm armour or the arms on your breastplate. Same if you go down low you don't even feel the breastplate. Okay, if I thrust up here, pass through, cut down there, it's just, it just doesn't become a problem anymore. But, that being said, if a breastplate's not relatively well fitted to you, it can be a problem. If these stick out too far from your ribs at the side, or if the breast sticks out too far uh, here, or bows out too much there, you'll suddenly find you basically can't use a longsword and you have trouble using a poleaxe. It becomes less and less of a problem the further apart the hands get, obviously, because now there's no conf conflict with those, uh, with the angles across the breast. But as soon as the hands get close, for example on a longsword, then that becomes quite critical. And to be able to get the hands, uh, rather the arms, close to the body, you need to have this part of the chest quite closely fitted. Despite the fact, I'll point out, that the bottom of the breastplate, the bit which will actually receive most of the impacts, from a lance or something like that, is quite far away from the body. I've got, I'm not that shape, I have quite a lot of space inside here. Um, but up here it's relatively close to the body because you need that mobility. And I should say as well, you might be thinking, well Matt, don't you need that kind of space up here that you've got down here? Well first of all you can't really have it while still having fighting mobility, but secondly, Remember, certainly with this period of armour and this type of armour, this part of the breast is augmented to some degree by the uh, chest, um, by the shoulder protection uh, overlapping it as well. Anyway, I hope that's been uh, a little bit interesting and useful. Um, so, breastplates do have to be relatively well fitted, and this distance away from the body here, both below the armpits, but also in front of the shoulders, the point of articulation, is super, super important if you want to be able to fight effectively, essentially. And it's not just, you know, it's not just swinging two-handed weapons. It also relates to uh, jousting things as well, being able to get the, the, the lance in there comfortably. Um, also, potentially things like climbing ladders, climbing over walls, mounting your horse, all of this kind of stuff. So, sometimes it's worth sacrifice, sacrificing a little bit of protection, so making this a little bit narrower, in order to gain greater mobility, and having greater mobility does give you more protection in the grand scheme of things as well. Anyway, thanks for watching, hope this has been interesting. Give us a like and a subscribe, and I'll see you really soon again on the channel for more armor videos, weapon videos, and all of those other sorts of things. See you soon, folks.